This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Stuart Wills. Moby Dick by Herman Melville. Chapters 4 through 7. Chapter 4 The Counterpane. Upon waking next morning about daylight, I found Queequeg's arm thrown over me in the most loving and affectionate manner. You had almost thought I had been his wife. The counterpane was of patchwork, full of odd little party-colored squares and triangles, and this arm of his, tattooed all over with an interminable Cretan labyrinth of a figure, no two parts of which were of one precise shade, owing, I suppose, to his keeping his arm at sea unmethodically in sun and shade, his shirt-sleeves irregularly rolled up at various times, this same arm of his, I say, looked for all the world like a strip of that same patchwork quilt. Indeed, partly lying on it as the arm did when I first awoke, I could hardly tell it from the quilt they so blended their hues together, and it was only by the sense of weight and pressure that I could tell that Queequeg was hugging me. My sensations were strange. Let me try to explain them. When I was a child, I well remember a somewhat similar circumstance that befell me. Whether it was a reality or a dream, I never could entirely settle. The circumstance was this. I had been cutting up some caper or other. I think it was trying to crawl up the chimney, as I had seen a little sweep do a few days previous. And my stepmother, who somehow or other was all the time whipping me or sending me to bed supperless, my mother dragged me by the legs out of the chimney and packed me off to bed, though it was only two o'clock in the afternoon of the 21st June, the longest day of the year in our hemisphere. I felt dreadfully. But there was no help for it, so upstairs I went to my little room in the third floor, undressed myself as slowly as possible so as to kill time, and with a bitter sigh got between the sheets. I lay there dismally calculating that sixteen entire hours must elapse before I could hope for a resurrection. Sixteen hours in bed. The small of my back ached to think of it. And it was so light, too, the sun shining in at the window, and a great rattling of coaches in the streets, and the sound of gay voices all over the house. I felt worse and worse, at last I got up, dressed, and, softly going down in my stocking feet, sought out my stepmother, and suddenly threw myself at her feet, beseeching her as a particular favor to give me a good slippering for my misbehavior, anything indeed but condemning me to lie abed such an endurable length of time. But she was the best and most conscientious of stepmothers, and back I had to go to my room. For several hours I lay there, broad awake, feeling a great deal worse than I have ever done since, even from the greatest subsequent misfortunes. At last I must have fallen into a troubled nightmare of a doze, and slowly waking from it, half steeped in dreams, I opened my eyes, and the before sunlit room was now wrapped in outer darkness. Instantly I felt a shock running through all my frame. Nothing was to be seen, and nothing was to be heard but a supernatural hand seemed placed in mine. My arm hung over the counterpane, and the nameless, unimaginable, silent form or phantom to which the hand belonged seemed closely seated by my bedside. For what seemed ages piled on ages, I lay there, frozen with the most awful fears, not daring to drag away my hand, yet ever thinking that if I could but stir at one single inch, the horrid spell would be broken. I knew not how this consciousness at last glided away from me, but waking in the morning I shudderingly remembered it all, and for days and weeks and months afterwards I lost myself in confounding attempts to explain the mystery. Nay, to this very hour I often puzzle myself with it. Now take away the awful fear, and my sensations at feeling the supernatural hand in mine were very similar in their strangeness to those which I experienced on waking up and seeing Queequeg's pagan arm thrown round me. But at length all the past night's events soberly recurred, one by one, in fixed reality, and then I lay only alive to the comical predicament. For though I tried to move his arm, unlock his bridegroom clasp, 
Yet, sleeping as he was, he still hugged me tightly, as though naught but death should part us twain. I now strove to rouse him. Queequeg! But his only answer was a snore. I then rolled over, my neck feeling as if it were in a horse collar, and suddenly felt a slight scratch. Throwing aside the counterpane, there lay the tomahawk, sleeping by the savage's side, as if it were a hatchet-faced baby. A pretty pickle, truly, thought I. A bed here in a strange house, in broad day, with a cannibal and a tomahawk. Queequeg! In the name of goodness, Queequeg, wake! At length, by dint of much wriggling, and loud and incessant expostulations upon the unbecomingness of his hugging a fellow male in that matrimonial sort of style, I succeeded in extracting a grunt, and presently he drew back his arm, shook himself all over like a Newfoundland dog just from the water, and sat up in bed, stiff as a pike staff, looking at me, and rubbing his eyes as if he did not altogether remember how I came to be there though a dim consciousness of knowing something about me seemed slowly dawning over him. Meanwhile I lay quietly eyeing him, having no serious misgivings now, and bent upon narrowly observing so curious a creature. When, at last, his mind seemed made up touching the character of his bedfellow, and he became, as it were, reconciled to the fact, he jumped out upon the floor, and by certain signs and sounds, gave me to understand that, if it pleased me, he would dress first, and then leave me to dress afterward, leaving the whole apartment to myself. Thinks I, Queequeg, under the circumstances this is a very civilized overture. But the truth is, these savages have an innate sense of delicacy, say what you will. It is marvelous how essentially polite they are. I pay this particular compliment to Queequeg, because he treated me with so much civility and consideration while I was guilty of great rudeness, staring at him from the bed and watching all of his toilette motions, for the time my curiosity getting the better of my breeding. Nevertheless, a man like Queequeg you don't see every day. He and his ways were well worth unusual regarding. He commenced dressing at top by donning his beaver hat, a very tall one, by the by, and then, still minus his trousers, he hunted up his boots. What under the heavens he did it for I cannot tell, but his next movement was to crush himself, boots in hand and hat on, under the bed, when, from sundry violent gaspings and strainings, I inferred he was hard at work booting himself, though by no law of propriety that I ever heard of is any man required to be private when putting on his boots. But Queequeg, do you see, was a creature in the transition stage, neither caterpillar nor butterfly. He was just enough civilized to show off his outlandishness in the strangest possible manners. His education was not yet completed. He was an undergraduate. If he had not been a small degree civilized, he probably would not have troubled himself with boots at all. But then, if he had not been still a savage, he never would have dreamt of getting under the bed to put them on. At last he emerged, with his hat very much dented and crushed down over his eyes, and began creaking and limping about the room, as if not being much accustomed to boots, his pair of damp, wrinkled cowhide ones, probably not made to order either, rather pinched and tormented him at the first go off of a bitter cold morning. Seeing now that there were no curtains to the window, and that the street being very narrow, the house opposite commanded a plain view into the room, and observing more and more the indecorous figure that Queequeg made, staving about with little else but his hat and boots on, I begged him as well as I could to accelerate his toilet somewhat, and particularly to get into his pantaloons as soon as possible. He complied, and then proceeded to wash himself. At that time in the morning any Christian would have washed his face, but Queequeg, to my amazement, contented himself with restricting his ablutions to his chest, arms, and hands, he then donned his waistcoat, and, taking up a piece of hard soap on the washstand center table, dipped it into water and commenced lathering his face. I was washing to see where he kept his razor, and, lo and behold, he takes the harpoon from the bed corner, slips out the long wooden stock, unsheaths the head, wets it a little on his boot, and, striding up to the bit of mirror against the wall, begins a vigorous scraping, or rather harpooning, of his cheeks. Thinks I, Queequeg, this is using Roger's best cutlery with a vengeance. 
Afterwards I wondered less at this operation when I came to know of what fine steel the head of a harpoon is made, and how exceedingly sharp the long straight edges are always kept. The rest of his toilet was soon achieved, and he proudly marched out of the room, wrapped up in his great pilot monkey jacket, and sporting his harpoon like a marshal's baton. Chapter 5. Breakfast. I quickly followed suit, and descending into the bar-room accosted the grinning landlord very pleasantly. I cherished no malice toward him, though he had been skylarking with me not a little in the matter of my bedfellow. However, a good laugh is a mighty good thing, and rather too scarce a good thing, the more's the pity. So if any one man in his own proper person affords stuff for a good joke to anybody, let him not be backward, but let him cheerfully allow himself to spend and be spent in that way. And the man that has anything bountifully laughable about him, be sure there is more in that man than you perhaps think for. The bar-room was now full of the boarders who had been dropping in the night previous, and whom I had not as yet had a good look at. They were nearly all whalemen, chief mates, and second mates, and third mates, and sea carpenters, and sea coopers, and sea blacksmiths, and harpooners, and shipkeepers, a brown and brawny company with bosky beards, an unshorn shaggy set, all wearing monkey jackets for morning gowns. You could pretty plainly tell how long each one had been ashore. This young fellow's healthy cheek is like a sun-toasted pear in hue, and would seem to smell almost as musky. He can not have been three days landed from his Indian voyage. That man next him looks a few shades lighter. You might say a touch of satin wood is in him. In the complexion of a third still lingers a tropic tawn, but slightly bleached withal. He, doubtless, has tarried whole weeks ashore. But who could show a cheek like Queequeg, which, barred with various tints, seemed, like the Andes' western slope, to show forth in one array contrasting climates, zone by zone. "'Grub, ho!' now cried the landlord, flinging open a door, and in we went to breakfast. They say that men who have seen the world thereby become quite at ease in manner, quite self-possessed in company. Not always, though. Ledyard, the great New England traveller, and Mungo Park, the Scotch one, of all men they possess the least assurance in the parlour. But perhaps the mere crossing of Siberia in a sledge drawn by dogs, as Ledyard did, or the taking of a long solitary walk on an empty stomach in the negro heart of Africa, which was the sum of poor Mungo's performances, this kind of travel, I say, may not be the very best mode of attaining a high social polish. Still, for the most part, that sort of thing is to be had anywhere. These reflections just here are occasioned by the circumstance that after we were all seated at the table, and I was preparing to hear some good stories about whaling, to my no small surprise nearly every man maintained a profound silence. And not only that, but they looked embarrassed. Yes, here were a set of sea-dogs, many of whom, without the slightest bashfulness, had boarded great whales on the high seas, entire strangers to them, and dueled them dead without winking, and yet here they sat at a social breakfast-table, all of the same calling, all of kindred tastes, looking round as sheepishly at each other as though they had never been out of sight of some sheepfold among the green mountains. A curious sight, these bashful bears, these timid warrior whalemen. But as for Queequeg, why Queequeg sat there among them, at the head of the table, too, it so chanced, as cool as an icicle. To be sure, I cannot say much for his breeding. His greatest admirer could not have cordially justified his bringing his harpoon into breakfast with him, and using it there without ceremony, reaching over the table with it to the imminent jeopardy of many heads, and grappling the beefsteaks toward him. But that was certainly very coolly done by him, and every one knows that in most people's estimation, to do anything coolly is to do it genteelly. We will not speak of all Queequeg's peculiarities here, how he eschewed coffee and hot rolls, and applied his undivided attention to beefsteaks done rare, Enough that when breakfast was over he withdrew like the rest into the public room, lighted his tomahawk pipe, 
and was sitting there quietly digesting and smoking with his inseparable hat on when I sallied out for a stroll. Chapter 6. The Street If I had been astonished at first catching a glimpse of so outlandish an individual as Queequeg circulating among the polite society of a civilized town, that astonishment soon departed upon taking my first daylight stroll through the streets of New Bedford. In thoroughfares nigh the docks, any considerable seaport will frequently offer to view the queerest-looking nondescripts from foreign parts. Even in Broadway and Chestnut Streets, Mediterranean mariners will sometimes jostle the affrighted ladies. Regent Street is not unknown to Lascars and Malays, and at Bombay, in the Apollo Green, live Yankees have often scared the natives. But New Bedford beats all Water Street in Wapping. In these last-mentioned haunts you see only sailors, but in New Bedford actual cannibals stand chatting at street corners, savages outright, many of whom yet carry on their bones unholy flesh. It makes a stranger stare. But besides the Fijians, Tonga de Boars, Aramangoans, Panangians, and Brigians, and besides the wild specimens of the whaling craft which, unheeded, reel about the streets, you will see other sights still more curious, certainly more comical. There weekly arrive in this town scores of green Vermonters and New Hampshiremen, all athirst for gain and glory in the fishery. They are mostly young, of stalwart frames, fellows who have felled forests and now seek to drop the axe and snatch the whale lance. Many are as green as the green mountains whence they came. In some things you would think them but a few hours old. Look there, that chap strutting round the corner. He wears a beaver hat and swallow-tailed coat, girdled with a sailor belt and sheath knife. Here comes another with a southwester and a bombazine cloak. No town-bred dandy will compare with a country-bred one. I mean a downright bumpkin dandy. A fellow that, in the dog days, will mow his two acres in buckskin gloves for fear of tanning his hands. Now, when a country dandy like this takes it into his head to make a distinguished reputation and joins the great whale fishery, you should see the comical things he does upon reaching the seaport. In bespeaking his sea outfit, he orders bell buttons to his waistcoats, straps to his canvas trousers. Ah, poor hayseed, how bitterly will burst those straps in the first howling gale when thou art driven, straps, button, and all, down the throat of the tempest. But think not that this famous town has only harpooners, cannibals, and bumpkins to show her visitors. Not at all. Still New Bedford is a queer place. Had it not been for us whalemen, that tract of land would this day perhaps have been in as howling condition as the coast of Labrador. As it is, parts of her back country are enough to frighten one, they look so bony. The town itself is perhaps the dearest place to live in in all New England. It is a land of oil, true enough, but not like Canaan, a land also of corn and wine. The streets do not run with milk, nor in the springtime do they pave them with fresh eggs. Yet in spite of this, nowhere in all America will you find more patrician-like houses, parks and gardens more opulent than in New Bedford. Whence came they? How planted upon this once scraggy scoria of a country? Go and gaze upon the iron emblematical harpoons round yonder lofty mansion, and your question will be answered. Yes, all these brave houses and flowery gardens came from the Atlantic, Pacific, and Indian Ocean. One and all they were harpooned and dragged up hither from the bottom of the sea. Can Herr Alexander perform a feat like that? In New Bedford, fathers, they say, give whales for, the, for dowers to their daughters, and portion off their nieces with a few porpoises apiece. You must go to New Bedford to see a brilliant wedding, for they say they have reservoirs of oil in every house, and every night recklessly burn their lengths in spermaceti candles. In summer time, the town is sweet to see, full of fine maples, long avenues of green and gold. And in August, high in air, the beautiful and bountiful horse chestnuts, candelabra wise, proffer the passer by their tapering upright cones of congregated blossoms. So omnipotent is art, which in many a district of New Bedford 
has superinduced bright terraces of flowers upon the barren refuse rocks thrown aside at creation's final day. And the women of New Bedford, they bloom like their own red roses, but roses only bloom in summer, whereas the fine carnation of their cheeks is perennial as sunlight in the seventh heavens. Elsewhere match that bloom of theirs ye cannot, save in Salem, where, they tell me, the young girls breathe such musk, their sailor sweethearts smell them miles off shore, as though they were drawing nigh the odorous Moluccas instead of the Puritanic sands. Chapter 7 The Chapel In this same New Bedford there stands a whaleman's chapel, and few are the moody fishermen shortly bound for the Indian Ocean or Pacific who fail to make a Sunday visit to the spot. I am sure that I did not. Returning from my first morning stroll, I again sallied out upon this special errand. The sky had changed from clear, sunny cold to driving sleet and mist. Wrapping myself in my shaggy jacket of the cloth called bearskin, I fought my way against the stubborn storm. Entering, I found a small scattered congregation of sailors and sailors' wives and widows. A muffled silence reigned, only broken at times by the shrieks of the storm. Each silent worshipper seemed purposely sitting apart from the other, as if each silent grief were insular and incommunicable. The chaplain had not yet arrived, and there these silent islands of men and women sat steadfastly eyeing several marble tablets with black borders masoned into the walls on either side of the pulpit. Three of them ran something like the following, but I do not pretend to quote. Sacred to the memory of John Talbot, who, at the age of eighteen, was lost overboard near the Isle of Desolation, off Patagonia, November 1st, 1836. This tablet is erected to his memory by his sister. Sacred to the memory of Robert Long, Willis Ellery, Nathan Coleman, Walter Canney, Seth Macy, and Samuel Gleig, forming one of the boat's crews of the ship Eliza, who were towed out of sight by a whale on the offshore ground in the Pacific, December 31st, 1839. This marble is here placed by their surviving shipmates. Sacred to the memory of the late Captain Ezekiel Hardy, who, in the bows of his boat, was killed by a sperm whale on the coast of Japan, August 3rd, 1833. This tablet is erected to his memory by his widow. Shaking off the sleet from my ice-glazed hat and jacket, I seated myself near the door, and turning sideways was surprised to see Queequeg near me. Affected by the solemnity of the scene, there was a wondering gaze of incredulous curiosity in his countenance. This savage was the only person present who seemed to notice my entrance, because he was the only one who could not read, and therefore was not reading those frigid inscriptions on the wall. Whether any of the relatives of the seamen whose names appeared there were now among the congregation, I knew not. But so many are the unrecorded accidents in the fishery, and so plainly did several women present wear the countenance, if not the trappings, of some unceasing grief, that I feel sure that here before me were assembled those in whose unhealing hearts the sight of those bleak tablets sympathetically caused the old wounds to bleed afresh. O oh, ye whose dead lie buried beneath the green grass, who, standing among flowers, can say, Here, here lies my beloved, you know not the desolation that broods in bosoms like these. What bitter blanks in those black-bordered marbles which cover no ashes! What despair in those immovable inscriptions! What deadly voids and unbidden infidelities in the lines that seem to gnaw upon all faith! and refuse resurrections to the beings who have placelessly perished without a grave. As well might those tablets stand in the cave of Elephanta as here. In what census of living creatures the dead of mankind are included, why it is that a universal proverb says of them that they tell no tales, though containing more secrets than the good one's sands, how it is that to his name who yesterday departed for the other world, we prefix so significant and infidel a word, 
and yet do not thus entitle him if he but embarks for the remotest indies of this living earth why the life insurance companies pay death forfeitures upon immortals in what eternal unstirring paralysis and deadly hopeless trance yet lies antique adam who died sixty round centuries ago how it is that we still refuse to be comforted for those who we nevertheless maintain are dwelling in unspeakable bliss why all the living so strive to hush all the dead wherefore but the rumour of a knocking in a tomb will terrify a whole city all these things are not without their meanings but faith like a jackal feeds among the tombs and even from these dead doubts she gathers her most vital hope it needs scarcely be told with what feelings on the eve of a nantucket voyage i regarded those marble tablets and by the murky light of that darkened doleful day read the fate of the whaleman who had gone before me yes ishmael the same fate may be thine but somehow i grew merry again delightful inducements to embark fine chance for promotion it seems ay a stove-boat will make me an immortal by brevet yes there is death in this business of whaling a speechlessly quick chaotic bundling of a man into eternity but what then? Methinks we have hugely mistaken this matter of life and death. Methinks that what they call my shadow here on earth is my true substance. Methinks that in looking at things spiritual we are too much like oysters, observing the sun through the water, and thinking that thick water the thinnest of air. Methinks my body is but the lees of my better being. In fact, take my body who will. Take it, I say. It is not me." and therefore three cheers for nantucket and come a stove-boat and stove-body when they will for stave my soul jove himself cannot end of chapters four through seven